Hello, welcome to the Wildline Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. This is a podcast about movies and how much money they make at the box office. Uh, welcome to the weekend review show. I do it every week on Sundays, uh, as soon as I can after the numbers drop, usually around 11 uh, a.m. Central Time. Uh, so let's walk through what happened this weekend, the weekend of July 6th through the 8th, the post uh, July 4th weekend here. It's been it's it's an odd weekend because July 4th happened on Wednesday. And if you're not listening, uh, obviously, from the United States, it's a massive uh, holiday here in America and everybody gets off work. And when it falls in the middle of the week, what ends up happening is people take the entire week off or they take off the latter half of the week. So this is really kind of like a, an extension of a holiday weekend. Um, and so a lot, of people, a lot of people took off Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So the numbers this weekend were a little bit strange and didn't exactly add up to what we were expecting. Uh, but the big opener of this weekend and coming in at number one was, of course, uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Ant-Man 2. Um, from MCU, um, you know, a, a strange day to open it. I thought they were going to push it to the weekend before July 4th. I think that would have made a little bit more sense to me. Uh, but they decided to do what they did, I think, with Spider-Man Homecoming, the same thing, and push it to the weekend after. Uh, in terms of what it did this weekend, so going into the weekend, tracking was saying around 70, 80, but then they were thinking um, 80 to 100. Uh, the nerds, and myself included, uh, I thought over 100 was almost a given for MCU at this point. Uh, I don't say that to sort of be negative when I get to the actual number because it's not that high. Uh, but the expectation amongst the amateur nerds and the pro nerds in the box office world were thinking that this was easily 80, 90, um, and a lot of people were thinking 100 plus for the opening weekend. So Ant-Man and the Wasp came in at its current estimate uh, 76 million dollars for the weekend so right in the middle of the very very conservative tracking that came in over the last few weeks um 76 is not bad right it's a what it's about a 34 percent increase over the first ant-man uh, which opened at uh, 57.2 million back in the summer of 2015. Now, let's contextualize this a bit. I love, if you listen to the podcast, I love contextualizing things. Because if I just tell you numbers and shoot off dates and stuff like that, like it's not going to really uh, tell you a story. And that's what I want to do. I want to tell you the story of the box office and, and what these numbers actually mean. And so when the original Ant-Man came out back in 2015... Um, I was really skeptical that it would do all that well just because that character seemed very minor to me. Um, and when it opened at 57.2, I kind of felt vindicated because that was one of the lower of the MCU openings. Now, it wasn't like terrible, but it was more like an Incredible Hulk op opening, right? Kind of definitely on the lower tier of MCU opening weekends. Uh, but Ant-Man, the original one, uh, turned out to be a, a beloved movie by people in the fan base. Uh, people, if you talk about anybody who's into MCU and Marvel, they love Ant-Man because it was a very different style than the other movies. It was funnier. It was a little more myopic, you know, a kind of a small scale, uh, pun intended, um, version of a normal MCU movie. What I mean by that is the story wasn't massive. Uh, it was about just, you know, basically one guy who wants to be a good father. Like, it didn't have this sort of mythos like the Avengers movies where it's like good versus evil throughout the entire universe. It didn't have that grandiose vision to it. And so I think people really appreciated that, especially in the fan base. Hey, here's an MCU movie. Here's a new character. It's funnier. It's more laid back. Just go have a good time with it. Uh, it's more of a comedy than even really an action movie. And so uh, despite the fact that Ant-Man 1 didn't open huge, it had a really good multiplier. I think it, it capped out at three, 3x multiplier, 3.1x multiplier, uh, which is really good for an MCU movie in general, uh, or comic book movie in general, I should say. Uh, it ended up uh, making over $180 million domestically. And so it was a win. It was a win for MCU, not on a big scale, uh, but they sort of proved that you could launch a new character uh, with a brand new lead, uh, somebody who, uh, let's think back to summer of 2015, Paul, Paul Rudd as a lead in a comic book movie, it just didn't add up to me at all. Um, but it worked because the role was more comedic and more laid back, and the movie was much more free-flowing 
than the other MCU movies, which could be a little bit serious and, you know, super grandiose. Uh, so Ant-Man wasn't that. So when the sequel came around here, the thought process was, I think, for a lot of people, hey, MCU can do no wrong. Like, let's just quickly look at what's happened over the last year or so with the MCU uh, movie universe, movie series, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, about a year and some ago, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy opened up at 146 opening weekend, closed out at 389. Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, which probably would be a decent comp to this Ant-Man movie, uh, even though that was a reboot and this is a sequel. Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming did $117 um, million its opening weekend. Same opening weekend as this one, the week and after July 4th. So Spider-Man Homecoming does 117, closes it out at 334. Great multiplier for a movie like that. There was a lot of concern with that movie kind of opening under the 120, 130 range, uh, but it ended up doing well with that multiplier. Uh, Thor Ragnarok opened up this last February, uh, opened at 122, closed out at uh, 315. Fantastic performance. Uh, Black Panther, um, of course, if you followed the show or followed the box office at all, you know that it you know broke a lot of records, opening at 202 and closing out. Still has not closed out officially, by the way, at the box office. They are still playing it. Uh, Disney and Marvel is trying to get it to the $700 million mark, which I think will happen. It's only about... 100k off of that mark right now. I'm sure fans will go out and see it to get it over that 700 million dollar mark. Um, Black Panther, a huge success across the across the board. Um, just a grand slam. Uh, Avengers: Infinity War opened up last April, um, only about two and some months ago. Opened at 257, breaking the all time um, opening weekend record, taking it away from Force Awakens, also a Disney franchise now. Uh, sorry, Star Wars. And uh, it's still going at 674. Um, that one, I, I did not think that. Well, why did I not think this? Um, but Avengers Infinity War is going to pass Black Panther. I don't know what. There was some discussion when it opened that it wasn't going to, but apparently its legs are doing okay. So it will pass Black Panther. What does this all mean, right? It's threw a lot of numbers at you. Um, MCU over the last year has not opened a movie under $100 million. Uh, in fact, it wasn't even close. The closest one was Spider-Man Homecoming, which opened at 117. So the expectation for MCU has changed a lot. And with Ant-Man 2 coming out, Ant-Man and the Wasp, I think I got caught up in it, in it, and a lot of other people got caught up in it in the industry thinking, man, MCU can do no wrong. Uh, everything they put out is going to open $100 million. The biggest, I think, proof of that was Black Panther. Completely new character. Not even that well known outside the comic book world opens to 202. That was proof that MCU knows how to bring out an audience. They know how to get butts in the seats, which is a really hard thing to do, no matter how good the story is or how good the movie quality is. Uh, MCU has figured that out, and Disney has figured that out. Uh, maybe not for Solo, but for most of their movies. And so I think. I got caught up in a little bit thinking, you know, how can an MCU movie open below $100 million opening weekend now? It's just a given. But with Ant-Man and the Wasp opening at 76, it's not that, like, things have changed. It, it is definitely, though, a coming back down to earth moment um, for people who follow this. And I think for Marvel themselves, I'm sure Marvel thought this was going to open over $100 million at Disney. I, I almost certain that they felt that that was going to happen. Um, there were a couple of warning signs that it wasn't going to sort of push the century mark here and, and get into that that rarefied air of the $100 million opening. Uh, the the pre-sales for Ant-Man and the Wasp weren't, weren't fantastic. It was a little bit of a warning. Uh, the tracking was putting it at 70 80 but like tracking has been so off recently i think back Panth black panther's tracking was off 40 million 30 million dollars so i think the assumption there is that like tracking's not really capturing everything and ant man's really going to over index and overperform in this post july 4th weekend um in terms of the quality of the film uh and i i, I I, I can already tell like my tone of voice is sort of like negative about it. Um, it's negative, and I'll say it's only negative because the expectation was so high here. Um, there's nobody out there in the box office nerd world, whether pro or amateur, that thought this was going to open below 80. There's no, nobody. 
Uh, so it is kind of a surprise and not a good surprise, I would say, um, for MCU and the Ant-Man series. It just, it, it feels like a very muted opening below like Doctor Strange. Like it just, which opened in November as a brand new character. Something doesn't connect here. Something doesn't feel right. So I'm going to try and figure out what that, what that is. Um, and I normally do this for, for big films. I try to do a little bit of like, not a postmortem necessarily, but just an analysis of why it opened the way that it did. Um, you know, 76 million was definitely on the lower end of tracking. Tracking have, had inched up as we got closer. Um, and the big culprit here looks like it was a very sharp Saturday decline. Um, as Deadline states in their sort of rundown, the expectation was this was going to drop about 15%. On that Saturday, but it actually dropped about thirty percent. So something happened there. Um, it could be this post-holiday weekend. Everything was kind of down, and the Saturdays were down with to to what their normal uh, should be. So that might have something to do with just a weird timing of the release, which is why I don't get why MCU or last year Sony would put out a comp- big comic book movie the weekend after. It just doesn't add up to me. Uh, any event, let's let's break it down really quickly. Ant Man and the Wasp. Uh, let's talk about product quality, right? Eighty six percent Rotten Tomato score from critics. Critics loved it, so that's end of story. This is a very good, very enjoyable uh, popcorn blockbuster movie. Done and done. Like there's no other discussion we had there. Audience score in Rotten Tomatoes is eighty um, percent, but we really can't take that too seriously. Uh, I take much more seriously is the cinema score. Uh, cinema score for Ant Man and the Wasp was a minus, which is a little bit lower than a normal MCU movie. They almost always get A's or A pluses. A minus is like for Thor: Dark World, uh, The Incredible Hulk, and now Ant Man and the Wasp. So that suggests to me, and if we zero in on that A minus score, it looks like the specific group of people that gave Ant Man and the Wasp A minus was the over twenty five crowd. Now, I don't know what that means specifically, but I can sort of um, guess or sort of figure out what could be the issue there. It it may just not have been super, super entertaining uh, compared to Avengers Infinity War. Maybe the smallness of Ant-Man and the Wasp uh, is one of the reasons why uh, it didn't pop off as much as it maybe it could have or should have if it wasn't following Avengers Infinity War about two months ago. Maybe the scheduling was too tight here. Um, that's what a lot of people are saying in the forums and stuff like that, so I'll, I'll present that viewpoint, not necessarily as my own, but as a viewpoint that you could look at. So you got like weird holiday uh, weekends, you have um, odd scheduling with Ant-Man and the Wasp coming out about two months after the biggest uh, MCU movie of all time. So I think those factors have some have something to do with it. The fact that the cinema score is down uh, with people over 25 compared to other MCU movies means there is a little bit of a, that was good, I enjoyed that, but it wasn't fantastic. Um, that's what I'm getting from that A- minus score. Now look, cinema score is a super small sample size. I think it's only like a couple of cities each weekend where they, where they do this. And if someone like went through the numbers about how actually how many people that they surveyed and it's really not that many um so we got to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt knowing that cinema score has some flaws in the way that they they measure this stuff but they're not glaring flaws but you just have to put that in perspective maybe they did phoenix this year this uh weekend and it was so hot in phoenix that like people were just pissed off and irritable and that's why they gave it a minus you never know right you gotta you gotta think about that stuff okay so um the product quality didn't seem like it was an issue at all uh, product conception, the idea of doing a sequel, makes sense to me, right? Like the first one, maybe not, didn't pop off, opened at, what, 57, closed out at 180. Not amazing for an MCU movie, but had a good multiplier, a cinema score of A. Um, and if you talk to, like, Marvel people, um, they really liked it. So I don't see any major problem with the uh, product conception. Marketing-wise, I think there was a little bit of an issue there. Um, you couldn't tell uh, what the market seems very vague to me. Uh, it seemed like uh, they were playing up the sort of comedic, fun aspects of the movie, but they weren't really telling you, telling you what was going on. They weren't really giving you a dramatic hook to bring you in. 
Uh, and that's from the trailers and TV spots that I saw. It, it just felt kind of like they're going through the motions. Like, here's a normal MCU marketing campaign. Um, and what, what, what's frustrating about that is the original Ant-Man marketing campaign was fantastic. They did all this weird stuff with Paul Rudd and Michael Douglas. It was so odd, like that weird Ants short that they did. Uh, it's like the weirdest 15 second commercial for an MC movie I've ever seen. In my life. It's just like, it's so weird and odd and bizarre, but that's what made it kind of fun. Cause it was so different. I didn't notice that this time with the marketing, uh, in terms of marketing quality, very traditional MCU, uh, campaign. Um, they flood everything for the first two weeks or the final two weeks, uh, and get everybody aware of this. Everybody knows that Ant-Man's probably coming out, but maybe that they don't know when. And that's the final two weeks is just like, just pump people full of these ads, letting them know it's going to be out in a couple of weeks. Um, so based on that, I mean, I don't really, nothing pops out to me as like an issue here. Uh, and, and I think that they're a major issue, I should say, besides the marketing quality, just didn't seem like it had enough of an edge or hook to it. Um, but that's the only thing that really sticks out to me as being an issue. Um, as to why this movie has underperformed slightly, um, I get the feeling that um, the Avengers Infinity War opening a couple months ago played into that. That would be, uh, I hate to say it, superhero fatigue it might actually exist on some level uh, but it, that it probably has more to do with scheduling than anything and not sort of any um widespread systemic boredom with comic book movies i don't see that happening in my lifetime at this point um so scheduling i think is probably a big issue here and the, the fact that it's over 100 degrees i think it's 118 degrees in the san fernando valley which is los angeles so uh, people in LA love to go to movies. I know it's one city, but like it, it's going to have a little bit of an effect here. Um, so how is Ant-Man going to play out over the next couple of weeks? So we're looking at 76 this weekend. Um, multiplier deadline says it's forecasted to do 2.7. That seems about right to me because of this muted opening and because it's sort of July 4th weekend here. Um, so if it does that 2.7 X multiplier, you're looking at about just over 200 domestic. Uh, I did some back of the back of the napkin uh, math here to see how profitable this movie was going to be. Uh, production budget was 162. Um, so normally the rule is for a big movie like this, you probably want to multiply that for by three, uh, and that that will get you the total costs for releasing the movie. Uh, in every single territory in the world, on every single possible platform, uh, including digital, DVD, all home entertainment platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so total cost should be around 486 for this, um, 480. Let's just say 450 to 500. That would be a good range. Um, you know, it's going to probably make just over $200 million here in the United States. These are not set in stone, by the way. I'm just guessing. That's sort of educated guess, if you will. Uh, so domestically, it'll... It'll definitely push over that 200 um, uh, barrier. And then internationally, you're probably looking at about 400 million, just because the last breakdown was 3565 domestic to international. So if it copies the original Ant-Man, you're looking at about $600 million worldwide. Um, now, what is that real revenue? No, of course not. There's all these different things that go into that money being separated out to different parties. The studio will probably get a about um, 85 to 90% of the global box office uh, as revenue once it is released this film uh, in every region on every single platform, theatrical exhibition, digital, physical media, and TV deals at the end of the day. So uh, my back of the napkin math says about at least $100 million in profit here. So this is not in any danger of losing money it's definitely going to be in the black by a significant margin um so there's nothing you know there's no real issue with that uh, the audience breakdown here for ant-man and the wasp uh 62 was over 25 38 then was under 25 so skewed older uh, much like the original uh male was 58 female was 42 so scaled a little older men um, which I think makes sense, but I think that's one of the reasons why it, it underperformed a little bit. It didn't really feel like a four quad movie. Um, I didn't really see a pull for females over 25 to go to this, if I'm being totally honest. 
Um, and I think a lot of that has to do, now that doesn't mean if they went to it that they wouldn't enjoy it. It just means that like the marketing didn't really seem to speak to that group of people. It definitely felt focused and zeroed in on the nerd fanboy uh, category of movie goer. Um, okay, so that's sort of the big overview uh, with Ant-Man. Definitely a little bit underwhelming of an opening at $76 million. Uh, it's nowhere near what MCU has opened over the last year. Uh, but if I'm taking a look back, it, it, it's sort of in line with not the original. It's more than the original. A little bit lower than Doctor Strange. Um, lower than the original Guardians of the Galaxy, which was four years ago now. Um, lower than Captain America Winter Soldier. I mean, it's it's on the lower end of the spectrum here. Um, it uh, And I don't... The question is, it's like, if... the is the multiplier gonna be good is the thing that I'm looking at. Now, here's the issue. If the multiplier is not good, let's say it's like 2.5 or lower. I don't think that's gonna happen, but it's always possible. Um, then there's a bigger issue going on here. Then there is some sort of either people didn't like the movie as much as we thought they did. There is some boredom with the Ant-Man character. Um, or maybe there's like an Avengers Infinity War hangover. Maybe that felt like it was the end for a lot of people and they're kind of moving on. I don't know. I'm not going to jump to any conclusions, but we'll see how the multiplier plays out with Ant-Man and the Wasp, but definitely uh, a muted opening to expectations. Uh, I certainly thought that it was going to open under a hundred million and it's not anywhere close to that. Uh, but it could really kick in here in the next couple of weeks, um, Everybody's on vacation. Uh, students are on vacation from school. Uh, so weekdays will be pretty high. It could follow Spider-Man Homecoming, where it opened really low and just had fantastic drops for, you know, week in, week out for a couple of months and ended up making quite a lot of bit of money. So Ant-Man and the Wasp could follow that pattern. So we will, we will keep a watch on that movie. On to number two now, Incredibles 2, at the box office for the weekend of July 6th through July 8th, 2018. Uh, Incredibles 2 came in at $29 million, a great 37% drop. It is a children's film, so drops are going to be lower. Uh, lost 300 theaters. Per theater average was $7,000. Um, its total take so far, Incredibles 2, $500 million. Half a billion dollars just domestically for Incredibles 2. Um, I believe that is the biggest take all time domestically for an animated film. I read that on Twitter somewhere, so I could be wrong, but I think that's right. So a huge milestone for Disney. Um, you know, Disney, If you, I, I did a, a mid-season review that I'm going to post sort of per, um, sporadically over the next week or so. And I go through each month, month and I walk through uh, how it did versus last year and how it did versus the last 10-year average just to see how we're doing this year. And it turns out we're doing okay. Uh, at the box office overall. Um, but one of the things that popped up in that special uh, was how powerful Disney is and how s kind of a little bit scary it is uh, if they end up buying Fox, 21st Century Fox, and their entertainment division, how much control they'll have over the entire marketplace. And I'm looking at, you know, it, it comes up because Ant-Man, Incredibles 2, they're the number two uh, first and second movie. You know, it's Solo, Avengers Infinity War, Black Panther. They really do own a big chunk of this marketplace. And the moment they take over for Fox, they would own Deadpool, uh, all the X-Men stuff. And it, it'd be really interesting because it's, I think the the marketplace would become very top heavy and Disney would be bordering on sort of a monopoly at that point. Um, but Incredibles 2 is a massive win for them. Uh, you can't really say enough about how well it's performing and how much this movie connected with audiences this summer. Um, there was such a nostalgic uh, trip and hype for this movie that um, it, it, I felt like it was going to do well, but this is sort of... It's one of those movies that just like broke out into a sprint and just has not stopped since. Uh, and so we'll keep an eye on that. It's going to be... God, I can't... Uh, let's look at the all-time right now. Um, or the yearly list um, so far in 2018, just to see where we're at. Um, it's already number three, obviously. Infinity War is at 674. Black Panther's at 699. Infinity War will pass Black Panther to be number one. Incredibles 2, um, I don't think it's going to catch up. It's been out for about a month. Doesn't seem like it's going to catch up to those two, but we'll see. You never know. Um, so it's a top three movie of the year. I don't know if it'll end that way, but it seems like it'll be in the top five no matter what. 
Um, not really expecting that coming in to this year. Thought I was going to do well, but not this uh, this massive overperformance that it's had. Okay, so Incredibles 2, number two, um, this weekend at $29 million. bucks. Uh, number three was Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, and it's third weekend here. It did $28.6 million, uh, a 53% drop. Ooh, that's pretty high. Uh, let's take a look at the, the last couple weekends, because I was not paying attention to it. Uh, last weekend uh jurassic park is not fallen kingdom is not looking great now that i'm taking a little closer look last weekend it did a 59 percent drop on its second weekend uh that's that's high i mean you gotta you gotta think the first weekend's gonna pop off it's a sequel it's gonna be like a hype factor so the second weekend's gonna be a come down but dropping 53% in its third weekend, that's not a good sign at all. And what that says to me is that word of mouth for Jurassic Park um, is not good. Makes sense. Critics hated it. Give it a 51% around Tomatoes. Um, a little bit higher of like the Metacritic actual score of a 5.7 out of 10. Um, audiences hated it uh, on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, let's take a look. I did not... Um, take a look at its cinema score a minus on cinema score so that's like not bad um but looking at these numbers ouch like this is not going to come anywhere near the first Jurassic world not even the same ballpark um with a big 170 million dollar budget huge marketing spend um it's going to be profitable i think i stated that the moment it opened it's going to be profitable uh it opened at 148 it's at 333 now um, it, it's going to do a, quite a lot of bit of, of money here. I think in terms of profit, it just is super underwhelming compared to the original, well, you know, opening over $50 million less than the original with these. And now it's got these big drops. Let's take a look at what the drops were for just quickly here. I don't want to like bore you guys while I'm searching on the web. Um, I kind of want to see what the drops were for the original Jurassic World because I felt like they would be a little bit lower than this. Yeah, they were. Um, wow. So this it definitely does paint a different different story. So Jurassic World, you know, obviously opened at two hundred eight, broke the record, didn't hold it for very long, dropped forty nine percent the second weekend, forty eight percent the third weekend, forty six percent, thirty seven percent. So um, yeah, this sequel is very much underperforming to the original. Uh, I don't think it's going to lose money. I don't think it's even going to be close to sort of the break-even point. I think it's going to be definitely in the black and make a profit of you know at least around fifty to hundred million, probably maybe even more. But it is an underperformance, and there's no other way you can you can view it. You can call it a win, but it's kind of a minor win. Uh, and it says to me that like the Jurassic World, Jurassic Park. Um, cinematic universe or series is going to need a little bit retooling if they're going to spend another 200 million dollars to make one of these movies i just don't i don't see them going like being super excited about doing another one uh if this one has underperformed uh compared to the ritual by so much um but they're still going to make money so maybe they say fuck it look, let's make another 100 million dollars in three years and, and put out another one of these but i, I just think the reaction to this movie has been so negative from critics and audiences alike that, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like a good idea to just redo uh, another Jurassic World movie and, and put it out there. Because it, it could get much, much worse very, very, very quickly. Because the thing about this is um, the reason that Jurassic Park Fallen Kingdom has done so well in the first couple of weeks uh, was because of the goodwill from the first movie. Like, apparently people loved it. They you know, obviously went to go see it maybe multiple times, played very well with the under-25 crowd. Um, so there was some goodwill. That goodwill is now probably faded because this movie is not very good and people don't like it that much. That will have a compound effect if you try to do a third one. So you're going to be going against all these forces saying, ah, the last one was trash, I don't want to see another one. And then you might end up in a Justice League situation where the awfulness of Batman vs. Superman, which is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life, for the record, um was a big reason why Justice League collapsed on its opening weekend because the people just had a bad taste in their mouth. Taste aversion takes one 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 meal 
right? Or, or one movie. And so if uh, people go to see Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom and don't like it and hate it, they're going to remember that when the next one comes around. So um, not a great story from Jurassic World. Again, it's not going to lose money, but um, I think all the other factors considered, it's, it's, not, it's not doing all that well. Um, okay, number four this weekend was a new wide release opener. Uh, the first purge, it opened up on uh, July fourth. It did nine million dollars on July fourth, uh, four point six on Thursday, six uh, and six on Saturday, and this Sunday today they're estimating about four point seven. Um, so seventeen million dollars for the three day, um, but thirty one million dollars for the five day uh, total release there. Um, you know, how does this really compare to uh, the other purges? I'm going to do a little. The best thing about Box Office Mojo is this showdown feature. Uh, now, they have to choose the movies. You can't choose them for them. Uh, it's great, like your own report, but it does um, give you daily box office numbers um, in comparison. And uh, this one's a little bit weird because um, uh, the first purge opened up on Wednesday. Uh, but just looking at the numbers compared to the other Purge movies, it's way down. Uh, it's way down across the board. Um, it's uh, it's just not it's not looking good. Uh, now, is it a is it a terrible performance overall? No, this movie costs thirteen million dollars to make. Uh, it's a Blumhouse um, Universal um, thing, so it's like I think it's Universal. Yeah, it is. It's Blumhouse and Universal have been doing this release distribution deal for a long time. Uh, they make movies for next to nothing, and they end up making a, a decent amount of profit uh, by not doing all that much money in the grand scheme of things. But the the productions are so low, and the marketing is so pinpointed and focused on social media that they save a lot of money in a lot of different places. So that if it ends up doing fifty million dollars domestically, that actually will make a big profit. Um, and so the performance of this one, you know, I think. Is the Purge series played out yet? It's been the fourth movie since 2013. Uh, the cinema score for this one was B minus, which is not good. Um, I think it's that's the lowest since the original. Uh, the first Purge got a C. Uh, Purge Anarchy got a B. Uh, Purge Election Year, which I think was the best one that I saw, uh, got a B plus, and this one got a B minus. So definitely a step back in terms of quality for this series. Um, critics hated it, gave it a 52% on Rotten Tomatoes, 5.3 out of 10 is the actual score. Audience scores are 39%. Uh, I don't get that. This is why I can't trust Rotten Tomatoes. I'll trust Cinema Score over Rotten Tomatoes. That's like how I have to look at it. Because um, what, 39%, like who goes to, uh, this is the fourth movie of The Purge. You know what Purge is all about. Like who goes to the fourth movie and gets upset that it's not what they want? I'm sure there's lots of violence, lots of like heavy-handed political messaging. Like that's what these movies are. Like they're they're B movies. Like who goes and like gets upset about that? Uh, I kind of look. At, I'm gonna look at these reviews here really quick. Uh, I'm not a big horror fan, but I always appreciate when a great horror film comes along. When The Purge was released back in 2013, I was very underwhelmed by it. Well, that's your problem. This is way too long. I'm not reading this. Um, a lot of one-star reviews from people. Um, I gotta, I gotta find some good quotes here for you. Uh, let's see. Didn't realize the movie was grounded in today's social, economic, political drama, racist topics, and didn't care for the movie. Oh, I know what happened. Uh, the movie has black people in it, and white people, for some reason, white racists in this country don't like that. <laughs> and there's a lot of white racists in America. Believe me. Uh, that's what happens here. That's why the audience score is so low. It's getting trolled, essentially. They're brigading it and lowering the score because it has um, black people in, in the lead. Um, and that's not probably the entire reason, but like, I've seen this over and over again with Rotten Tomatoes. There's a very strong element of people online who are alt-white, alt-right, which is just another term for white supremacists. I don't know how this happened. It didn't really exist out in the open 10 years ago, especially even online. Now there's just this component of people who feel like it's okay to attack other groups of people because of their the, their skin color, their beliefs, or and it's a very cultish group of people, uh, and it's really sad that they would at even attack a movie like The First Purge, which is just come on, it's a throwaway B movie. Like get over yourself. Um, okay, that's a little bit of my political rant, um, but uh, it's a decent performance. It's going to make some money, uh, but it does seem like this series is starting to to wind down a bit. 
Um, you know, the original opened at 34. That was a big surprise when it did that. Closed out at 64. Uh, Anarchy opened up at 29 and closed out at 71. Uh, Election Year opened up at 31 and closed out at 79. This opened at, first purge opened at 17 officially for the three day, uh, but it's currently at 31. Uh, multiplier in this is gonna be rough. Um, because of the weird opening, let's give it like a three. So you're probably looking at like 50 million bucks. Um, yeah, this is not, the election year was the biggest one, uh, which was the last one, it almost did 80 million. It's gonna be about, at least 20 million off of that, maybe 30 million off of that. So, um, I think the expectation here is that the purge series is, is going to wind down maybe with this movie, maybe they do another one. Uh, I say that though. And like saw had like what, nine movies. So you just never know sometimes like if, uh, Blumhouse can make another one for 5 million, I'm sure universal will be like, please let us release it. Cause we're going to make like at least 30, $40 million in profit off that. Uh, and you can't like they yeah, they print money over there. So, um, but my gut says that like, it's a played out idea. Blumhouse doesn't really like to do that. They kind of want to do, they want new weird ideas and that's why they're so successful. Uh, they, they basically take a really strange odd script shoot it for five million bucks with a nice sort of almost blockbuster sheen to it i just watched truth or day last night which is also a blumhouse universal co thing it, it was great like it was a stupid horror movie i knew that going in but it was like written decently well it was shot well and the acting was okay and i had a good time with it that's what blumhouse is all about and um they're just good at that. They're super good at that. And um, I get the feeling that they kind of want to put the purge thing to bed and move on to other things. It would be my guess. Uh, but we will see. Okay. So that was the first purge um, coming in at number four this weekend at $17 million, but 31 over the five day. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Sicario Day of Soldado. Um, second weekend to 7.3 million, a massive 61% drop. That is not a good sign for that movie. Um, I, I thought it opened um, kind of lower than I thought it was going to at 19 uh, last weekend. Uh, I thought based on the quality of the first movie and how much people... It's kind of like the first Sicario almost feels like it's already a cult movie. Because when it opened in, what was it, October 2015, I think? I think around then. Um, it just didn't... It didn't pop off at all with mass audiences at all. Um, but through like people seeing it and like being on VOD and it being on HBO or stars, whatever it was on, people realized like, holy shit, this is a good movie. And it was a really good movie. The ending's terrible. Don't get me don't get me started in the last 30 minutes of Sicario, because I'm gonna get just get pissed off. The first hour and a half is brilliant. One of the best action scenes I've ever seen in my life is the boarding crossing. It is like it's already classic film. Like it's already like a, a classic moment in cinema. Uh so well done. And so with the second one coming out, I felt like there was gonna be this big hype because the first movie people slept on it when it first came out, but then they caught it later and loved it. I thought that was gonna kind of bridge over the second one but i brought this up the last couple of weeks um we're in a really strange political moment in the united states um i don't need to go say any more about that just there's a huge immigrant sort of made up crisis that the government is now cracking down on uh it's like t it's separating mothers from their children at the border it's disgusting and vile and immoral on so many different levels that i don't want to go into it but people are being inundated with these news stories about uh, immigrants from Latin America, Mexico, um, uh, Honduras, uh, Guatemala, places like that. And so like a movie that sort of takes place on the border and there's violence back and forth, it, it might be too much for people right now because it's too close to home. Uh, but the Sicario 2 opened at 19 last weekend. 7.3 this weekend is not good. A 61% drop for a movie like this is really... Um, it's a very bad sign that the legs are just going to drop out on this. And um, I, I don't remember what the um, cinema score is. A B cinema score. That's not good. Um, people didn't like it. As simple as that. And general audiences didn't like it. The first one got an A minus. And that's that that's first Sicario's tough movie, I think, for people, too. And it got an A minus. 
I, I think the quality was so high in certain aspects of it that it overwrote sort of the weirdness and oddness of the script and the narrative, uh, which was very sort of unorthodox, I would say, overall, and a very kind of quiet, slow-burning film. Um, Sicario seemed a little more action-based. That's why I thought it was going to pop off, and it just it has not. Um, and I think it's probably a little bit of the quality issue, different director, no Emily Blunt this time. Um, I felt that it was strange for them to want to make a sequel to that movie. It didn't seem like it needed a sequel. Um, but Josh Brolin and, and Del Toro signed on. Tyler Sheridan wrote the script. Um, I'm definitely, I haven't seen it yet. I'm definitely going to go see it. It looks awesome. Um, but general audiences have not reacted well. And the second weekend drop um, tells me that the multiplier is going to be terrible for this movie. So not not good at all for Sicario. Uh, number six this weekend, number six was Uncle Drew. Uh, 6.6 million, 56% drop, um, 29, almost $30 million so far in its second weekend. Hey, remember when I said this was going to break out? Well, I was totally wrong. It is not broken out at all. Um, terrible drop in its second weekend. It's going nowhere. Uh, number seven was Ocean's Eight from Warner Brothers, still out there in its fifth weekend. Did 5.2 million, a good 37% drop. Um, lost 822 theaters. Per theater average is right at that Mendoza line. The cutoff of sort of doing well versus not anymore at 2K per theater. Total tech so far for Ocean's Eight is 126 million bucks. I've talked about this one a lot. Performance is decent. Uh, it's not terrible. It's not great. Kind of middling right in the right in the um, center of expectations, I would say. Uh, and so um, an okay performance overall. Uh, number eight was Tag, um, Warner Brothers New Line, rated R comedy, another one. Um, 3.1 million for the weekend, 47% drop, a little high. Lost a thousand theaters though. This one's DOA essentially. Per theater average was below 1500 at 1439. Um, total take so far for tag was 48 million bucks. There has not been a rated R comedy this year that has broken out. They've all done decent. Like none of them have like massively, massively flopped. I'm thinking like blockers. I'm thinking game night. I'm thinking life of the party. Was that rated R? Probably. Um, so they've all like ended up in like the 50, maybe 60 range, which is not bad. I'm sure they're going to like make a little bit of money or break even on those, especially when you bring in like VOD and stuff like that. Um, but they just none of them have broken out, and we're still at like anything about like the last year of the house and Baywatch, and there was like a fist fight, and there were so many last year. Um, that there's someone's got to come up with a solution to this problem. I don't know if it's an actual problem, sort of maybe making it up, but like there is an audience for kind of adult comedies, um, that may be a little bit raunchy, maybe a little bit violent, whatever. Deadpool's proof of that. Um, there's got to be, there's an audience out there and they just have not made a movie that really connects with that audience or brings people out like Judd Apatow is able to do with Knocked Up or, um, or a movie like, um, Super Bad or a 40 year old virgin, uh, any of those, this is 40, any of those movies that are like rated our comedies, um, part of that whole, um, sort of genre that boomed over the last 15 years it's just complete. It's just died out after the Hangover series. It feels like Girls Trip was a good example of a breakout. Uh, the original Bad Moms, not Bad Moms Christmas, but the hits are few and far between for the rated R adult comedy drama. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Tag is just another, uh, not necessarily like a shipwreck, but it's just it's not breaking out at all. Okay, let's move on. Uh, number nine was Won't You Be My Neighbor from Focus. This is the uh, Mr. Rogers documentary. 2.5 million this weekend on only 893 theaters. Uh, that's good for a documentary. Uh, two point, uh, sorry, $2,900 per theater. Uh, the total take so far for Won't You Be My Neighbor is 12.3 million. That is so good. I knew that it was going to break out. The quality apparently is super high. I saw a segment on it on Sunday morning and it was like bawling after like the f five minutes of it. I was like, this, this is going to be great. People are going to love this. It's definitely one of those movies that's going to play in like New York, Los Angeles, Seattle, Chicago. It'll do really well in those urban, um, sort of more cosmopolitan areas. Um, much like, um, RGB or Ruth Gator, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, sorry, RBG. Uh, that documentary was a really big surprise hit, uh, this year. 
Uh, number 10 was Deadpool 2 still sticking around uh, in its eighth weekend, uh, 1.6 million. Uh, per theater average is an anemic 1300. This one's going to disappear pretty quickly. It lost 800 theaters this weekend. Uh, total take for Deadpool 2 uh, was $314 million. A, a good performance, profitable without a doubt. Um, just didn't really take off like um, an MCU movie would. It's not doing 500 million. It's not even doing 400 million. So it's not really in the super tier A echelon. Uh, but it's a decent performance, I think, for Deadpool too. It's just not where Fox wanted wanted it to be. Um, okay, so that's the top ten for this weekend. Let's quickly talk about maybe some limited releases that are out. Whitney, the Whitney Houston documentary from Roadside Attractions, uh, one point two million dollars in its first weekend. Uh, a weird sort of mid size opening, four hundred fifty two theaters. Uh, per theater average was twenty seven hundred dollars. Um, that's not good. I'm looking at it now because, like, I heard about this coming out, but there wasn't a ton of marketing. Roadside Attractions is all over the place with how they release films. Um, this one doesn't look like they did the right job here. This, this to me, Whitney seems like a movie that you would push out in, um, probably more African American areas first, get that hype and excitement about the film going and maybe they did maybe the 452 theaters is just like it's focused on areas with high concentrations of african americans or at least theaters that uh that have that demographic and then um and then see where it goes from there it just i don't know i feel like the qual the quality movie is supposed to be very good and um documentaries are i just talked about won't you be my neighbor we talked about with uh, better ginsburg they're hot right now for whatever reason um and you would think that Whitney would sort of be a part of that, but it's just it's just not taking off the way I would want it to. Um, Twenty seven hundred dollars in four hundred fifty two theaters is not a good great opening. So maybe like word of mouth will kick in. They're probably going to expand a little bit more. But the thing is, if it's below two thousand, they're not going to expand it. If, it, if the per theater average is below two thousand, they're not going to add a thousand theaters because they're like, why would I do that? I can add another movie and make 3K per theater. Like, what theater owner would want to do that? So it's kind of in a wishy-washy place right now. So it's got the word of mouth better kick in really quickly or it's going to fade away. Um, so that was one limited release. The other really one I want to talk about in terms of limited releases was from Annapurna. Uh, Sorry to bother you. I can't remember what festival it was. I think it was probably Sundance. Super, super hyped. This thing is red hot in terms of hype. Uh, the marketing's been fantastic. Um, this one has a chance to break out, uh, unlike, and, and Deadline actually brought this up in their write-up, you know, Sundance darlings like me, Earl and the Dying Girl, and Dope, uh, also had red hot, uh, hype and just collapsed on wide openings during the summer, right? So this is kind of like following that pattern, Sundance darling, tons of hype opening in the summer, um, but Annapurna made the great choice of doing, let's do 16 theaters and see how it does. So they opened it on 16 theaters and it did $45,000 per theater. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, now, if if Sorry to Bother You had opened up on four to five theaters and did $45,000, that would be something to notice. It'd be like, oh, that's like disobedience numbers that opened earlier this year. That's like that's really kind of abnormally high. I think it's the fourth highest per theater average this year. The fact that it's on 16 theaters, and I can't do the math. I don't really know how to translate 45k on four theaters versus 45k in 16 theaters there's just not a ton of data to support it or i haven't looked into it um but i'm getting the feeling like that's really good and if it was on a smaller group of theaters it seems like it would be in the 50 60k theater per theater average so we got to keep our eye on that one um this has oscar buzz written all over it i know it's coming out in the summer but i'm thinking maybe some writing uh, maybe some acting awards, um, best film, maybe possibility. Um, but uh, hey, it's already Oscar season, right? We're only we're only eight months away from the Oscars, or nine months away from the Oscars. Um, but let's keep an eye on that one because that one's going to be a really interesting movie, um, a really interesting performance, I think overall. Okay, um, any other limited releases to talk about? Um, oh, Leave No Trace came out. I didn't realize that came out. 
another Sundance Starling movie um, that has a lot of Oscar buzz. Um, ben Foster plays the lead. Uh, it's coming out from Bleecker Street. I really want to see it. Everybody at, at Sundance was raving about it. Um, its performance has been okay, actually. Uh, it's in second weekend, added 28 theaters. Um, it did uh, about a quarter or half a million dollars. I'm sorry, yeah, half a million dollars this weekend. But the per theater average was okay um, at $11,500 in, in 37 theaters. Obviously, it's not going to compete with Sorry to Bother You. Sorry to Bother You is too much hype and too much audience support already. But Leave No Trace might play around in the background for a while. Uh, and that will help its Oscar changes as we get closer to that season. Um, okay, I think that is all I wanted to talk about in terms of limited releases and the top 10. Um, just to briefly recap everything in terms of what we talked about. Uh, Ant-Man underperformed. I, that's the only way I can put it. If it, it can win back a sort of decent performance if the legs kick in and like it has Spider-Man Homecoming legs over the next few weeks, which I think is a really distinct possibility just because of the weird weekend that we had here in the States. Um, but uh, it's another performance. And I don't think there's any, I don't care what tracking said, like tracking is just tracking interest in the film. Tracking is not what the expectation for the film is. The expectation for Ant-Man and the Wasp was 80 to 100, at least 100 plus over in, uh, as an over performance. We weren't talking 120, but that wasn't out of the po range of possibilities. I was thinking 110. Uh, so definitely pretty significant underperformance to expectations. Still going to make a profit. Um, no real issue with that. But I don't know. It's it's something we're going to watch and, and kind of check out here. Has MCU moved on to a different phase? Is, is the big question in my head. Has, was Avengers Infinity War the bookend to that phase of their business? And now they're moving on to another business, another phase of it. So we'll see. I don't know. Um uh, first Purge, Arp is okay. I, I, hopefully that's the last one in the series. It's, it's sort of been played out way too much. Shikario's not doing well. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is not doing well. Um, going to make money, but nowhere near what the original did. Uh, Incredibles 2 is crushing per usual. Uh, and some documentaries are doing pretty well. And we're going to watch Sorry to Bother You as a limited release. Uh, let's talk briefly about what will be coming out over the next couple of weeks. Um... Sorry to Bother You is expanding. Um, this is, it doesn't, uh, the fucking um, box office mojo is all fucked up right now. Um, uh, Sorry to Bother You is expanding at some point. I'm not really sure when. They call it a sci fi comedy. I guess you could call it that. Um, I, I hope it's coming up soon. Maybe it's later this month, but they're expanded out to 700 theaters. Uh, next weekend, okay, let's talk July 13th really quickly. Uh, Hotel Transylvania 3, Summer Vacation, getting very good reviews. I think that's going to do quite well and really going to take a bite out of Incredibles 2 uh, later part of its run here. Um, I think a lot of people are going to go see uh, Hotel Transylvania 3. Uh, so I think it's going to do quite well. 4,000 theaters. Um, Skyscraper is coming out. Um, uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Uh, it looks like a combination of uh, San Andreas and Rampage, maybe. I don't even know what to think about that movie. Uh, it looks like, uh, am I going to see it? Yeah, I'm going to see it. It looks stupid. It looks fun. Um, but uh, I wonder what the reaction is, the general audience is. I would expect like a 30 to $40 million opening for Skyscraper. I think it's a throwaway action movie in the middle of summer. You really can't go wrong with that. If it was in August, I would be a little bit more of a down on it. But like the fact that it's middle of July, uh, it's going to be super hot everywhere. People are going to be bored because they're not at school or whatever, or not at work. So I think it's going to do okay. Um, I don't think it's going to open over 50 or anything like that, but I think it's going to have a decent opening. Uh, eighth Grade comes out, limited release on A24. Watch out for that movie. Um, I believe that one Sundance, maybe? I don't know. Uh, a lot of art hype for that movie. Is it going to do well overall? Eh, I, don't, I don't really care, to be honest with you. I'm more interested in the artistic impact of that film and how it's going to do in the sort of the award season. Uh, so that's next weekend. Equalizer, uh, July 20th, Equalizer 2 comes out. Um, it's going to do okay, I guess. I don't really know. Mama Mia sequel comes out. Uh, who asked for that? Sorry. Um, Unfriended Dark Web comes out. I don't know that much about that one. It's from the imprint of Blumhouse, Blumhouse Tilt. Um, Blumhouse Tilt, I think, I might be guessing here, I'm sort of in, insinuating, is like the low budget 
of the movies that they do. So look at Purge. First Purge was $13 million production budget, which is very low comparatively to the rest of the marketplace. Uh, but with uh, the Blumhouse tilt label, I think they cap them at like 3 to $5 million for a production budget. Um, so I don't know. That one's not going to really do that much, I don't think, at all. The first Unfriended was stupid. Oh, God, the movie's so dumb. Um, but it did okay. So I think, you know, obviously they did another one for like three million bucks and just throw it out there and see, see if we can make some cash. Uh, then we're in the end of July, uh, Mission Impossible Fallout. I think that's going to be really big this summer. Uh, just because there's not a lot else coming out. Um, Teen Titans go to the movies. I don't have no idea what that is. Warner Brothers animation. I don't have kids, so... I'm not sure what that is at all. Uh, Hot Summer Nights comes out eight, from A24 um, that weekend as well. Look out for that one. Um, that one has a little bit of a sort of art house buzz to it. Uh, and then we're into August, and August is filled with a lot of trashy movies. Um, I always want to like just skip August because it looks, and especially this year, like besides the Meg, I don't know what's coming out that I would be remotely interested in seeing. Uh, Sony is dumping Alpha. You guys remember Alpha? That was like a movie that was supposed to come like three years ago. For some reason, they're dumping it in the worst weekend of the year, which is like August 17th, which nobody goes to the movies the last two weeks of August because they're all going back to school um, or whatever work, whatever you want to call it. But that's a, it's a, it takes a huge chunk out of the audience the last two weeks. And like the last weekend of August is, I think, one of the worst weekends of the entire year. Um, so it's a... It's a really strange summer. That's all I gotta say. Everything was front loaded uh, in April and May, and a little bit in June. Uh, and now it's just like there's nothing massive coming out. Someone was saying the other day, um, I think I mentioned this on last week's show, some investor was like, We're not gonna see another $100 million opening for a while. Um, there's nothing in, this, in July that's gonna open over 100. Um, I mean, the only thing that would flirt with it was Mission Impossible Fought. That's probably not going to happen. Obviously, Meg's not going to do that. I got to find out before I end the show. I got to find out um, what the next $100 million opera guess is. Uh, there's nothing I'm really seeing in August. Um, nothing in the end of August. Um, let's look at September really quickly. The Nun will probably be big on September 7th, but definitely not a $100 million opener. There's a possibility that the Predator opens to $100 million, but I doubt it. Um, come on, where's the next $100 million opener? Wow, there's nothing in September outside of the Predator that I think could do it. Um, First Man? Nope, definitely not $100 million opener. Goosebumps 2? Halloween? Oh, man, dude, there's nothing. We may not have another $100 million opening weekend until, uh, I guess, November? Um, even then, the Grinch could do it. Fantastic Beasts, but probably not. Creed 2, Robin Hood. Um, none of those are a sure $100. Nutcracker in the Four Realms, maybe? Uh, Dr. Seuss might be the best one, but it's animated. The Girl in the Spider Web's also coming out. That should be cool. Um, Spider Web, uh, the new Spider Man in uh, December, is animated. Yikes. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing a clear hundred. I'm certainly not seeing a hundred fifty million dollar opening. I'm not seeing any movie that looks like a surefire hundred million dollar opening uh, until maybe December. Aquaman's probably not going to do it. Bumblebee, the new Transformers movie, doesn't look like it either. Holmes and Watson. Uh, I think the the biggest opening <clears throat> um, that we'll see. But it's not even going to count. It would be Mary Poppins Returns with Emily Plans, Mary, Mary, uh, um, Mary Poppins. That's the, the closest one. Okay, I've rambled on enough. The, 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 the point is that th we're in a really quiet stretch here for probably the next six months. Uh, there's not going to be a huge, massive opening. That is clear right now. Something might develop, like a storm develops. There might be a max massive opening for a movie that we didn't think was going to open massively. Um, but I'm not seeing a lot right here that looks like a $100 or $150 million opening. In any event, thanks for listening, guys. I'm going to be a lot more active on Twitter these days, so definitely um, follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm going to kind of make it like uh, a hub for all things box office. Um, and so do check it out. Uh, it'd be a good place to just follow if you want to like check it and see what's going on at the box office every day. Um, I'll have all the numbers and stuff up there. Um, so thanks for listening, guys. This has been the Wild Line Podcast. Mm -hmm.